So as Derek said, I'm Tammy Skinner. For anybody who I haven't met that's on today, um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm the managing attorney in the Alpharetta office, but I've been with the firm 22 years. So um, I've known Michelle a really long time as well and know a lot of you. So if we haven't met, I look forward to seeing you at the closing table soon. Um, but the, you know, the common theme is going to be really good communication because our goal is to really help you be proactive on the title issues instead of reactive. Um, and so as we're talking through the issues, I want to kind of give you the red flags so that you're a really good listener on both the listing and the selling side and can identify the issues and talk about how Weissman can help you kind of be preemptive and work through issues at the listing phase even so that when you get to uh, you know contract phase you can kind of have smooth sailing to the closing table or it may be something that's really not ready to be listed so before you expend your time and energy and putting it out there and marketing time you know we kind of can work through the issues so that you are ready to list it and not have any problems so you know, the first thing I would say is, you know, delivering all of the important documents to us. So as we're talking through, I kind of want to identify what are the documents you want to be getting from your client on the front end. Um, and, you know, notifying us about special circumstances. So one of the big things we um, struggle with, I would say, is making sure that on the front end, we are receiving complete contracts, complete contracts and all amendments. So just remember, if you're turning that in to solid source, there, you know, we want to make sure that uh, amendments are the biggest ones, I would say, especially amendments to address concerns, anything to do with inspections, repair items. Um, those things, a lot of times you're kind of running fast and furious, you're working through the detail, and then you forget to send that amendment through. So just kind of top of mind, remember, every time you're signing amendments, just be thinking, hey, I need to make sure to turn that in. I need to make sure that Weissman has that. I need to make sure the lender has that. Um, so if you, you know, for example, get to closing phase and you receive an Alta and the first thing you see the purchase price is wrong, your first thought shouldn't be, oh, somebody make, made a mistake. Your first thought should be, uh-oh, they may, maybe somebody doesn't have the amendment uh, on that purchase price. And the most important thing you can do is just get that to us immediately. And we can work with the lender and get that fixed. So good communication. When we're sending out paperwork, if you see anything that doesn't look right, just pick up the phone and call us right away and we'll work through it. Um, but the bigger piece I want to talk about is kind of special circumstances. And this is really where um, just being proactive on the special circumstances is going to help us tremendously. I'm going to run down kind of the list of all of the things that I put in that category of special circumstances, and then we're going to really um, hone in on two today. So, you know, death, big one. If you have, you know, anyone in the chain of title who has died, we need to have a conversation about that and make sure all of the paperwork is right. And most importantly, we want to make sure that you have all the proper people in the transaction signing not only the contract, but your listing agreement to make sure you have a valid listing. Um, and then even on the buyer side, you know, this is why you want to be a good listener on the buyer side, because if you hear commentary about estate or death, you also should be thinking, do we have all the correct parties to the contract? Because everybody wants to get the deal to the table. So death, trust, if your sellers you know, own the property in a trust, um, corporate sellers or buyers, we want to make sure we have the proper party signing. Name changes, power of attorney, need for a mail away, 1031 exchange, um, you have an out of state seller, uh, and you have a, a non-US citizen seller. So those are kind of like the my laundry list of what I would call special circumstances. And here's what's important. I, you don't need to learn 
all the law and all the detail behind all of these special circumstances. What we are asking for you to do is to identify it. This is one of those things that Tammy was talking about. This is one of those circumstances where we have a seller who falls within a category of a special circumstance. And it's something I, as the agent, should reach out to Weisman and say, this is what I have. What do you need from me? And what do we need to look at to make sure everything's on track? Okay. And then we can tell you, this is what I need you to ask your seller for. So today I want to focus on, if we have time at the end, we can do one or two more, but I really want to focus on probably the two most common ones we deal with are death and divorce. Okay. So um, let's talk about first divorce and you know, I'm just envisioning what you do, you know, typically in a lot of cases, when there's a divorce situation, you may be dealing with only one party, you know, one owner. And with all of these things, I kind of like have this little tagline in my head, you know, what I think it's important for you to realize is that your clients most typically are going to tell you as much as they think you need to know, right? And a lot of times what I find is people aren't really trying to be cagey. They're not trying to lie. They're not trying to withhold information. So either they just don't know and don't understand the importance of the information, or it's just personal and private, and they're trying to share in uh, limited capacity based on what they think we need to know, and they maybe don't want to open up and share more. And interestingly, the closer you are to the party in relationship, the tighter to the vest they usually hold the information. Do you find that to be true? It's like pulling teeth a little bit. And so that's a good you know, situation where, for example, if you called me as the Weissman attorney and we talked it through and you were really close to the person, you know, you just kind of have to have your way that you pull this information. And one thing you can say is that the listing phase is, you know, I understand there's a divorce situation. I think it would be a good idea. We want to do some fact finding on the front end. I think it would be a good idea for me to put you in touch with our closing partner, you know, Tammy Skinner over at Weissman, for example, talk through where things are. That way she can get from you any paperwork they need to review to make sure everything's, you know, in order for us to list the property and not have any hiccups along the way. That kind of takes you out of the middle of that and puts in a third party who, you know, they may be more comfortable being open with. But again, if it's really just, I, that's why I like it, a, a pretty, you know, generic, it's a fact finding. We want to make sure we're on track. So when somebody files a divorce, the, uh, there's a standing order in every county in the state of Georgia, which essentially makes the property uh, subject to the jurisdiction of that court. And the order basically says neither party can sell any asset, including the house, without permission of the court. So, you know, when somebody says they're divorced, first thing we have to evaluate is kind of where are they in the process? Are they thinking about filing divorce? Have they already filed divorce? Is it in the middle of divorce or is the divorce final? So that's the first thing we're gauging is kind of where are we? If they haven't filed for divorce, a lot of times it's best to just wait, sell the property and then go through that process. But um, again, we can evaluate that. And the reason we're trying to figure this out on the front end is Oftentimes you need both spouses, even if you're dealing, for example, with the wife and the wife says, she's the only one living in the house. She's the only one you're sitting at the kitchen table with discussing things. And she says, I got the house and the divorce. And what I would like you to be thinking, this is your, your tagline. I would like you to be thinking, prove it. Every time a seller tells you something, I would like this little voice in the back of your head say, prove it. Right, not again, because we think we're lying or we think they're you know, not being forthright. It's just, we wanna have the paper trail and make sure that what they're saying is accurate. So even if the wife 
did get the property in the divorce, that doesn't mean the husband does not have to sign your listing agreement. That does not mean your husband, the husband may have to sign a quick claim deed. So if the husband is not cooperative, we need to evaluate that right at the beginning, right? So if she says that, you just say, that's fine. I understand that. Uh, one thing that would be really helpful is if we go ahead and submit all of the paperwork for the divorce to the closing attorney to review for us and make sure how we have to sign everything, who has to sign. And um, so let's start with the divorce is final. They've gone through the divorce. Everything is done. What you're going to be asking them for is a copy of their divorce decree. So essentially what typically happens in the divorce is that the parties enter into a settlement agreement that kind of hashes through, they go through uh, a mediation or arbitration type process and they work through all of the details of the divorce, you know, kind of who gets what as far as assets, um, what happens with the bank accounts, the cars, child custody, all of those issues, alimony, and then, you know, it can be very specific and a very good detailed agreement with regard to the property. It can be as detailed as who gets to hire the listing agent, who gets to set the price, um, you know, how the proceeds are split, or it can be very vague and not very helpful. And we have to do a little more digging in those instances. So um, we need that settlement agreement. And then generally what happens is the parties present that settlement agreement to the uh, judge and the judge enters a final order. Typically, I don't want to say rubber stamping, but typically that's what it is. The final order will say something to the effect of, um, I hereby grant the divorce and um, give effect to the settlement agreement dated August 1st, 2022. And sometimes it will go one step further and say, you know, um, Mrs. Skinner uh, can uh, resume her maiden name of Tammy Spivak. And that's important too, right? To help us know how to sign the paperwork. So divorce decree and settlement agreement, if the divorce is final, is what you want to ask them for. And then what you want to send us to, because that, to us, because then we can look at that, read through, and then typically what I would do is email you back and say, this looks great. This is who has to sign. This is how they have to sign. And right then and there, we know is hubby involved, right? Do we need to have him on track? The, the court can go one step further in their order and say, um, I judge Smith hereby grant all right title and interest in 123 Smith Street to Tammy Skinner, okay? Short of that, that very specific order, which is very unusual, you still have ownership based on what's on the vesting deed, okay? So just understand that. It's very unusual for the court to go that far and put that specific language in their decree. Also understand that divorce attorneys don't do real estate closings typically. And so a lot of times their orders are not as detailed as we would like them or we need them to be. So an additional piece of information that we would like to have is the name of, and phone number for the divorce attorneys. So that if we need any clarification on anything, we have a way to reach out to the, get the divorce attorneys involved. So if the divorce is still pending, technically speaking, we have to figure out, are we able to close and disperse money, right? Because the court hasn't yet signed off on anything saying who gets what money. So are we able to close and disperse the money? Do we have to wait to close? Or can we close, and sometimes an option is close, and one of the divorce attorneys will hold the proceeds in their escrow account pending the final order of the court. Now, why is that important? Think about that. If your seller, either of the sellers are selling the property and they need their proceeds to go buy their next property, 
they're not going to want one of the divorce attorneys to hold the funds, right? So what may have to happen is they may have to go back to court before closing and get a very specific order of the judge regarding ability to close and disperse money uh, if that hasn't been worked out. So that's a detail that, again, is going to be very dependent on the language in the settlement agreement, the where they are in the process of the divorce, um, and how cooperative the parties are. So you can imagine that really runs the gamut. Um, I guess one forewarning I would give is even if they say it's very amicable and we're in agreement on everything, we still have to have the paperwork in place, even if they're in agreement. Um, we may be able to draw up a disbursement agreement for closing if the title company approves that, if the parties agree to the split of the proceeds. So there's just a lot of detail to it. And as you can imagine, we can typically get a sense early on of what we're in for, it, meaning we're in for you and me, right? The, all of us to get this deal to the finish line. Um, the biggest challenges are where you have an ex-spouse who has to participate in some form or fashion. They have to sign a quick claim deed. They have to sign off agreeing to the amount of the proceeds. And I've had it all over. I've had where they're completely MIA or where they just are not going to agree. Because remember, many times the sale of the property is kind of the final piece of the divorce. So in my experience, one spouse may say, be seeing that as an opportunity to exercise their last bit of control in the situation. And they can really be um, obstructive in the process. And in that case, we may have to get the court's assistance to be able to get that deal to the finish line. So again, reviewing the documents ahead, communicating with the parties ahead, it really gives us a sense of how easy or how difficult the, the transaction's going to be. Um, over the years, what I have learned is the more open-ended questions I ask, the more information I get. So that's why I like that. When agents call me or when I call to say, hey, thanks for the contract, I always say, well, you know, here's my very legal question. Is there anything funky about this deal that I need to be aware of, you know, to make sure that we don't have any, um, you know, surprises or that we have a smooth transaction? And you'd be surprised what people tell you. But if I asked very pointed questions, I'd probably get yes, no, yes, no. So again, I think that's gonna work the same for you with your seller. You can, we just need a copy of the death certificate and we're gonna record the death certificate with the new deed so that the next person who runs title realizes Bob and Mary own the property, Mary died, the new deed is only gonna be signed by Bob. We record the death certificate so they realize why Mary did not sign that deed and that there's not somebody missing in the chain of title. So if they were not joint tenants, and I typically see this, I have two situations. You have someone who has an older deed, they've owned the property a long time. It was not as common to put the joint tenancy language on those deeds, or what I call a home bake deed. You know, people are just preparing their own documents or they're going online and pulling some deeds most typically that does also does not have the joint tenancy with rights of survivorship language. So those are two circumstances to really be thinking about this might be a situation where we don't have a proper deed and we need to do more. So if there's no joint tenancy language and an owner has passed, we're gonna need a copy of the will. And if they say they've already probated the will, a copy of the letter's testamentary. And that's what the court issues, basically affirming that the person named as executor in the will or administrator in the will or executrix, whatever language, it's fine, that they will be able to proceed uh, in that capacity as executor of the will. And why is that important? because um, 
Think about the executor wearing a different hat. And remember the executor um, owns the property in that fiduciary capacity. So for example, if Tammy Skinner is executor of the estate of Doug Skinner, then when I sign the contract, it's really important that I sign the contract as Tammy Skinner as executor, because that's how I have the capacity to sell the property. Tammy Skinner, myself individually, has no ownership or representative capacity in relation to that property. Does that make sense? Right? So if you have, so for example, if I did not own that property jointly with my husband, and so I owned it, so Tammy Skinner is one seller, and then I'm the executor of his estate. So the person, actually, the people actually selling that property are Tammy Skinner individually and Tammy Skinner as executor, right? Because my husband's interest is via me as executor. My interest is via me individually. So you really can have two signature lines, Tammy Skinner and Tammy Skinner as executor, or one line, Tammy Skinner individually and as executor. But I think about it as what hat are you wearing and make sure your signature line is correct. And the easiest way to figure out how to do the signature line, if you have letters testamentary, is to put it on there exactly how it says on the letters testamentary. So, you know, Mary Smith as executor of the estate of Bob Smith. That's exactly what your signature line is going to read. If you can't fit it on your signature line, you can always start it on the signature line and do a special step in your contract, spelling out the, the capacity and the signature. And that's true for any capacity. So if you have a trust, sometimes those signature lines can get really long. Um, any signature line, if you cannot fit it, just put a special step in your contract saying, you know, the seller, all parties agree that the seller is, and just write it all out. Um, okay. So uh, one thing I'll just throw on there. So you may see executor, you may see executrix, executrix used to be used, you know, for a female. Everyone's pretty much referred to as executor nowadays. It's not a deal breaker. Don't sweat it. All right, either one is fine. Um, if the estate's been administered, you may have what's referred to as letters of administration as opposed to letters testamentary. So those are things, if that's the case, what I would ask you to do is ask your seller for the paperwork, email us a copy of the vesting deed and a copy of whatever information you have gotten from the seller, the will, the letters, anything you, the seller's been able to give you. And again, we'll email back and say, everything looks in order. Please ask the seller if they have X, Y, or Z, or you look good and here's what your signature line should read like, okay? And so this may be a situation where we see we're gonna need a bunch of beneficiaries to sign off. Let's start now. If you're at listing phase, let's start now. Let's see, let's get the addresses and names of you know, all the beneficiaries and let's start sending out. There's no reason they can't start signing off on what they need to right then and there. No reason to wait till you're under contract. You can go ahead and list the property. You don't have to wait until the probate is complete, but it is critical that you make your contract contingent on the completion of the probate. Makes sense? What you don't want to do is enter into a contract with Mary when Mary and Bob own it and Bob's estate is going through probate, have Mary sign all of your paperwork, agree to close in three weeks, and then you can't get it to the closing table because the probate's not complete and you never mentioned the probate. Potentially the seller would be in breach of contract in that situation because they can't convey marketable title to the property. So it's okay to go ahead. You just have to make sure, absolutely 100% sure that you have a stipulation in your contract 
identifying that the probate is happening and that the contract is contingent on the completion of the probate. Same thing with a divorce. As long as it's contingent, you have to, again, disclose the situation and make your contract contingent on the completion of whatever the court process is. It's an interesting question because sometimes what happens is, you know, someone may um, become the executor and then they do an executor's deed before they sell and they do it into themselves individually. And now you're selling the property and they own it individually. There's definitely more tax implications now for them selling as an individual than there were, you know, was selling it um, in their representative capacity. But this is what I'll say. This is what you should always say. I defer to your CPA on that. Essentially a tax deferred exchange where the person is selling their property. There's very, very specific timeframes and uh, disclosure requirements for 1031 exchange. The entity that handles the exchange is known as an intermediary. And so Weissman can handle the closing but we cannot handle the closing and be the intermediary. That's a conflict of interest. So we would handle the closing part. If you need an intermediary or a referral to an exchange company, I, we certainly can provide that for your client. But basically, I literally am just doing a reverse exchange to this morning was working on it. So, but the general common exchange is I sell my property and then instead of me taking the $100,000 in proceeds, I identify a replacement property that I am gonna use that $100,000 to purchase that replacement property. And instead of me having to report or claim any uh, tax liability with regard to that $100,000 in proceeds, I'm able to defer that and you can continue deferring that through additional exchanges. But my $100,000 then doesn't come to me at closing, it goes to the uh, exchange company and they hold it. And then when I identify my replacement property within the time and, and provisions required, and you can't miss by a day, you're, you're, you are out of luck if you miss that, the deadlines. And then the exchange company basically will uh, provide that money then for the purchase. And you can replace with one or multiple properties um, that's just a very, you know, kind of nutshell overview. There are, um, you do have to put a contract, uh, stipulation in your original contract identifying as part of a 1031 exchange, the seller, uh, because the buyer on your sale and then the purchaser on the replacement property will need to sign off just acknowledging that it's part of the 1031 exchange. Uh, the intermediary will send very specific um, instructions to us that we have to follow for closing. They have to review and approve everything along the way um, and have certain uh, very specific time deadlines as well.